Thank you. I would like to tell you about a friend of mine, an uh, unlikely friend of yours. He's a retired industrial worker, and he has spent most of his life grinding the edge of toilet seats. Uh, but he did tell me a story, and that's the story I would like to share with you today. His name is N7331227, and he's an industrial robot. Now, the reason why I know him is because me and a group of artists and engineers was uh, commissioned to do an art piece, an interactive art piece about industrial robots. Uh, so in the beginning, we thought we were going to tell the usual story about industrial robots, how they're fast and efficient and can do things so much better than you and I. Uh, and then we met N73312278. And, and he really looked much more like an old, grumpy old man. He, he would be moving sluggishly, and he, he had like joints that were worn out. You can almost see he was in pain. <laughs> and at this point, we could have chosen to just repair him, stick with the story, and, 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 and get out without telling about industrial robots. But instead, we saw a story. We saw a story about a retired industrial robot the retirement life of an industrial robot. We thought that was an interesting story to tell. So we wanted him to do things that retired people do, have time to sit around in, a, in the park and look at people, or, or have a hobby or something. I mean, it's like... <laughs> but more importantly, more importantly than all this, that we wanted him to move like an elderly person. We wanted him to move like somebody who had had a hot life in a factory, maybe he even had a bad knee, and he was like struggling and being like a little bit uncomfortable in his, in his, uh, in his body. There's a fundamental difference between the way that people and robots move. I'm sure you're all aware of that. People move in a in a personal way. They like constantly shift their attention around, and they, they the objective for their movement is constantly changing. And this is demonstrating our free will as people. Whereas industrial robots always do things in, in a more controlled way. It's always A to B, it's always predetermined. So, so everything is really figured out before anyone starts to move. But this was a really problem for us. This was a, a, a problem. There's none of the parts of, of the robot systems was made to make it move in such a casual way that people would move. So eventually, we decided, or eventually we were led to, having to rebuild these systems ourselves. We simply had to design something our own. So we started to take, the, take apart the robot systems. We started to like, remove all the industrial control from it and fiddle around with its wires and, and, and figure out how systems work. This was really a difficult task because the robot was designed in a time before the internet, believe it or not. So technology from before the internet, that's ridiculous. <laughs> so there was hardly any information available. So we were spending a lot of time tinkering with the robot, trying, probing its wires, figuring out what goes where. And this is a very sort of, it, uh, during this time, we got a very personal relationship with the robot, with this particular machine. And some of us, some of the team took it more literal than others. Uh, Jonas, my friend, who is a programmer, he was programming the robot systems. He would be sitting under the robot. He would almost be cuddling up with the robot. And sometimes he would be sitting on top of it while he was programming. So, so we got this very personal relationship to this machine, an unlikely relationship, if you want. So the robot was slowly recovering from its brain surgery. We removed all the systems from it. And, and we started to teach it things that that people do, like sweeping the floor with a broom or typing on a keyboard, like, like people thing. And eventually, it slowly became more and more human. Uh, at some point, we wanted to figure out its new life by looking into its old life. We thought, in its old life, it would just only focus on its work, never pay attention to people around it. So we thought, now we would do things different. We would give him vision so he could see and follow people's faces around. Uh, he would also always do what he was told. 
And so we thought that this time he might want to do things differently. We thought that he would like to have his own say about what to do. So uh, we gave him a hobby. We gave him a hobby. He would look at, at, uh, at pictures that people would draw for him. And then he would flip switches on his, uh, on his uh, control panel to switch on and, on and off light bulbs on a light bulb canvas. We imagined light bulb canvas, that's something a robot would like. So <laughs> that is, uh, that is uh, how personal we got with the robots at that point. So the robot would now be much more human than before. It would pay attention to its surrounding. It would look at people, always from a respectable distance, obviously. Sometimes it would flirt a little with you. And Sometimes it would just get tired and go and take a nap. <laughs> so we were getting really comfortable with this machine. Like we really didn't think about it as, as a mindless, dangerous, big machine that, will, that, will, uh, that we really shouldn't hang around. So as you can see, we're, <laughs> we're being friends with the robot now. So at some point, just hours before the unveiling of the exhibition where this robot was in, his nose, or his little pokey thing, got caught on a big 150 kilo steel panel. And obviously the robot just flipped it across the room with a giant crash. And this caught us completely by surprise. Because in our minds, the robot <laughs> was now a person. It was like one of the team, one of the guys. He would never be so inconsiderate as to throw things around. I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> At the same time, we knew that we nailed it. We knew that we have done what we set out to do. We have created this illusion that the robot was a person and it had personal characteristics and it even fooled ourselves. But more importantly than that, during this process, we've developed a whole bunch of new technologies. We've invented, apparently, a whole new way to control industrial robots. We've invented vision systems. We've invented uh, motion algorithms. All not because it was kind of was part of some kind of technical specification that was thrust upon us. It was because we wanted to make our friend go. It was because our friend was blind. We wanted to give him vision. <laughs> he was lame. We wanted him to make, make him move. And later on, when we met people that was, that was uh, experts in industrial robots, they would be amazed about some of the things that we did was even possible, because they've never seen something like that before. And I know that a lot of you may not be comfortable with having such a personal relationship with the machine, but I believe that being put outside your comfort zone, like being forced to do things in a hard and difficult ways, will open up new possibilities that you didn't even think about from the beginning. So that's really the lesson that the robot taught me. And that's really my advice to you as well. Next time you're faced with a challenge, where you have to do something that you can't do with existing tools, or you can't do it with existing knowledge, use your emotions the same way as you use your brain. And I guarantee you, you will discover new things. Thank you.